I'm really happy to be able to have this chat. Um, my role at Monash is a lecturer um, in the law school, in the law faculty. Um, what I teach on the whole um, is public law. So the ideas associated with laws created by governments that go from kind of the state, the government, to individuals. So to contrast that with a private law, where you're talking about law compared one individual to another individual. So I teach in the public law space, um, and that's where a lot of my research broadly sits. So most of my research interests relate to this concept called the rule of law, which we'll obviously talk about today. Um, in relation to that, though, I've also folded in this broad interest I have in artificial intelligence. Um, so a bit of my research over the last couple of years has started to bring together the idea of the rule of law and bring together the idea of artificial intelligence to say, well, when we're thinking in terms of public law, when we're thinking in terms of what artificial intelligence can and may actually do, what does that mean? Um, so that's kind of the space I'm, I'm in at the minute, um, thinking about what artificial intelligence can do for public law, um, what it means for public law, and the same in terms of this idea of the rule of law. Awesome, thank you. And then um, we just wanted to know for the Deep Neuron members, why do we need to consider law and ethics when developing AI and what motivates you to research this area? Um, so I think one of the most fundamental reasons or the, or the caution that would spring to mind is the, the great line from Jurassic Park. Um, so Jeff Goldblum in that movie, um, who probably has a character name in that movie, but nobody cares because it's Jeff Goldblum. Uh, so he has the quote where he says something along the lines of, we were so preoccupied with whether we could, we didn't stop to think whether we should. And that to me is really the most important aspect of where AI needs to go because AI is being developed and being created by some of the smartest people on the planet because things are moving so quickly. Um, it is gonna be so easy in some senses to actually say, well, here's a great thing that we can actually do. Let's do this thing without then thinking through whether we should do this thing. And I suppose that to me feeds into, well, what does the should mean? Does it mean we have to think through the unintended consequences? Um, this idea of, well, yes, if we want to achieve X, we may ultimately achieve X, but what does that mean for Y and for Z? Um, trying to make sure we think through those issues, thinking about the most basic idea of um, AI and the law's interaction of liability. Um, if we create an artificial intelligence, we stick it into a, a self-driving car, and that then chooses to run over um, a bus stop full of school children instead of um, a 40 something year old guy because it somehow values that 40 something year old guy over more than the, the children. Who do we blame for that? Um, do we blame the car company? Do we blame the software developer? Do we blame the AI itself? Um, whether it has legal personality or others. So there are all these different issues that need to be thought out before we unleash even basic forms of AI into the world. Um, super simple example. Last night, I asked Alexa, apologies for anyone listening to this, and let's just um, turn their device on. Um, I asked Alexa whether you can feed potatoes to a dog. Um, Alexa gave a very cagey answer. Alexa said, potatoes are not considered poisonous for dogs, but you should cons consult your veterinarian before feeding anything to your pet. Now, I have absolutely no doubt that the people who programmed some of Alexa's responses are thinking in terms of liability. Um, I, they may have thought, I do not want to be liable for someone feeding vast amounts of potatoes, 10 kilos of potatoes to a five kilo dog, the dog dying, and somebody then deciding to sue Amazon for millions of dollars for the dog that they've lost. So even in that very simple instance, we can see the way that law and technology are starting to interact, that advice that is being given is hedged a little bit for potentially 
legal liability reasons. Um, so that's just a couple of very basic ideas, I think, as to why law and AI need to be thought about very carefully, why there is a, an interaction, why there's an overlap. And that idea, um, I'm not an ethicist, so I should say that right off the bat. Um, the idea of ethics, though, goes along broadly the same lines. It goes back to the idea of Jeff Goldblum. Well, what does it mean if we're doing these, um, if we're creating these artificial intelligences? Should they do X? Should they do Y? Who has rights in this discussion? Um, do we as humans have rights? Well, yes, we do. Do we need to start considering the rights of the um, artificial intelligence? Um, so again, then it goes to not just the question of does an AI have a legal personality, but in, encompassed within that legal personality, does it also have rights? Um, and, and that I think is gonna be one of the really important and interesting interactions between when we're thinking about what an AI can do and what we're thinking about in terms of law and ethics. Awesome, thanks so much for those examples. Um, did you end up feeding your dogs the potatoes? A very small potato. It is quite a small dog. Um, and yeah. he was quite happy with the potato, but it, yeah, he's, I don't know whether he will continue eating potatoes. He likes chicken a bit more. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and this kind of relates to the previous question, but what do you think are some of the biggest challenges you face when attempting to apply ethics and law to AI? example, um, transparency um, and the idea of explainable AI. So for me, transparency is a concept associated with the rule of law. It's an important thing. But then you've got the idea of explainable AI and some idea of transparency in terms of can we see what the algorithm is doing, how it is getting to the decisions that it is getting to. Um, I'm assured that for very simple algorithms that we can figure this out and we know how they're doing it. But as soon as it gets complicated, we get to the black box problem and all of a sudden we, we don't know. And so what I'm trying to think about in that space is, well, I may have a very straightforward sort of conceptual idea. I may have a view as to whether this thing should be done, um, but my technical colleagues may be turning around and saying, well, actually, no, it can't be done. So you kind of get it flipped the, the other way. So trying to get my head around the, the IT aspects um, of, of AI um, and, and trying to make sure that some of the things I talk about, some of the things I think about are, are staying in a, a space that is hypothetical, um, yet not complete science fiction. Yeah. And in your research project process, do you collaborate a lot with IT colleagues and engineering colleagues to kind of overcome those challenges? But it is actually harder than just working within your own little silo but that's not a bad thing. Yeah, and I think definitely like those considerations as part of the aims of the committee um, that we're forming at Deep Neuron, so that's really good to hear. Um, and then finally, for the final general question, um, what excites you about the future of this area of research? It might be cliched, but everything. Um, everything in the sense that I have absolutely no idea where it's gonna go. Um, in five years time, I might be talking about something completely left of center because that's just where things moved. So in a sense, I'm getting moved along by the caravan. Um, and that's exciting and terrifying all at the same time. Um, when I've been thinking about rule of law things, my PhD was on uh, two rule of law thinkers from the 17th century. Um, their ideas haven't changed much in the last 300 years because they've been very dead. Um, so that's very backward looking. Um, we kind of know what we've got. We can work with the, the tangible things. I knew what the research agenda would look like for however long I wanted to do it, simply because the source material will never change. But now when you start thinking about an idea of the rule of law, great, that's still an old idea. But then you start bringing that into conversation with newer technological developments everything changes. The whole world in effect changes because it will depend what I end up talking about on what somebody else does in the, the near and midterm, um, which, yeah, 
tremendously exciting stuff. And the fact that I get to talk about stuff that no one else has had the opportunity to think about is also quite um, interesting. Yeah, I guess you've sort of touched on the rule of law in this discussion a bit, and it's a big focus of your writing. For the, the, the non-law students listening, could you give a, a brief rundown of what the rule of law means to you? Great. So this is um, my perennial concern. I've spent many years now thinking about the rule of law. And when people ask me, well, what is the rule of law? Um, my answer is often I don't know. Um, but I get that wouldn't be a very satisfying answer for you. Um, so there's different levels at which you can think about it. Um, so the rule of law is a political concept that is probably almost definitely the most important political concept on the planet, certainly as far as Western liberal democracies go. It is the overarching idea that structures most societies, and it is the idea that arbitrary power is a bad thing and it should be avoided. Now that in and of itself is a problem because then we have to start thinking about, well, what is arbitrary power? Um, mostly we would think about the application of arbitrary power from a state government, for example, whether that be the Australian government, whether it be the Victorian government, whether it be the UK, America, wherever it might be. And that idea comes down to, well, if the state does something that we consider to be arbitrary, that is a bad thing. So we take that as a premise. You then get into the discussion about how are we going to define arbitrariness? Um, because up to now, almost everyone who's ever talked about the rule of law would be on board and would be nodding along and saying, yep, I agree completely with that. And there are different theorists and theories about what the rule of law is. So there would be thin theorists, um, thin conceptual theorists who would say, well, it's kind of a procedural idea. As long as you tick certain boxes when you are making laws, and laws being the way that the state imposes its power on um, society. As long as you tick those procedural boxes, then you're all good. It doesn't matter what those procedural boxes are. It doesn't matter whether it's a bad outcome. So the paradigmatic example here is the German state under Hitler could be seen as a wonderful rule of law state because there were laws, also there were rules in relation to how those laws were made. Was the law made in the German parliament? Yes. Um, was it promulgated and sent out to the people? Yes. Um, go through whichever ones of those, we get to the end and we say, yep, this is sort of rule of law compliant. But as we all know, some of the rules and the laws that were passed were abhorrent, they were immoral, they were evil on any measure. But to thin rule of law theorists, that doesn't make any difference. It's still the rule of law. What they would say is, well, if you don't like what comes out at the end, change the rules. Say to be rule of law compliant, it needs to be something else. Now, there are thick rule of law theorists who would say, actually, the end result does matter. So people like Tom Bingham in the UK, the ex um, now deceased uh, Supreme Court judge, and he has a much thicker idea of the rule of law. The UN give a much thicker idea of the rule of law. And what they say is, well, to be compliant, to agree with the rule of law, uh, the laws that come out the other end must respect human rights. They must be in accordance with international law principles and these sorts of things. So they're actually saying, yes, you need to do those procedural things. You need to tick these relevant boxes. But we don't adhere to the rule of law if, for example, the end result is against human rights. So that's two very broad ideas and then and even within those we can segment the ideas down so thinking about um, thin rule of law people um, there would be any number of theorists dicey hayek fuller raz um, who may have a very different idea about what the rule of law is and they would require different things different list of different things on the list to to tick so we still don't know is as is, I said, what the rule of law actually is. It's this contested concept. Um, we can all probably agree it's a good thing, but we don't necessarily know why it's a good thing because we don't necessarily agree what goes into making it. All right, thanks. And um, how do you see the rule of law um, in its effects on governments and revolutions in the past? 
So certainly in the past, what we have seen, so I mentioned a couple of those theorists. Um, there is a, a group of theorists I call the usual suspects of the rule of law. And some of them are quite well known. Aristotle would be one, uh, Locke, Dicey, Hayek, Fuller, Raz. Um, Raz is the only one of that list who is still alive. He's a Jewish American a philosopher currently at Columbia University. Um, Aristotle, as most people would probably know, is quite dead. Um, now, each of those um, have their own idea. But what we can see from the societies in which most of them came from, there was a fundamental societal upheaval happening at or around that time. So what we tend to see is, as each one gives their version or their idea of what could be a rule of law idea, we're seeing in tandem some sort of revolution. So um, a classic example would be Locke. Well, at the time that Locke was writing a huge political turmoil in, in England, um, we end up in the sort of inter-revolution period between the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Um, we end up seeing uh, huge amounts of disquiet in society. Oh, we, we are scared of the Pope ruling. We are scared of the King ruling. Um, what are we going to do? Can we be, should we be scared of Parliament? And Locke is trying to write to sort of get rid of some of those fears. Um, that is a classic instance of a revolution. We were seeing similar things in terms of, of Dicey, for example. There we have this sort of revolution in terms of the administrative state. Um, writing in late 1800s, 1885, I think he wrote, what we end up seeing is society sort of pivoting and shifting away from a system where everything was judge-made rules um, in the application or the execution of laws, going into uh, administrative tribunals, administrative decisions, the, the sort of state-based apparatus getting much larger. And he thought that was a real problem. And again, um, Hayek, similar thing, fears associated with totalitarian rule and kind of a revolution happening there as well, that he's writing during or immediately after uh, World War II. So we, we saw a revolution there in the sense of different ways in which the state was to interact with its people. He feared that we were going to see the state being much more overbearing, nationalization of state assets, that sort of thing. Um, and he saw that as a revolution. He wanted to try and head off and actually try and change. So for each one of these, we get a revolutionary idea from them about ways to counter or to justify, um, depending on which side of the coin they were on, um, the revolution that was currently happening. Right. And in your writing, you've talked a bit about how our fears of AI, be it irrational or from pop culture, influence conceptions of the rule of law. Um, could you please give a bit more of um, a background on what these fears are and the effects that they might have? So one of the things I think about, and again, not a technological um, AI person, but what is clear to me that when a lot of people in the wider society think about AI, their mind may go to popular portrayals of AI, um, albeit fictional. And we struggle a little bit to find good, friendly examples of AI. Um, most examples will go to um, the Terminator. They will go to Skynet. They will go to ideas of iRobot. Um, and admittedly, Asimov did write some good AIs. Um, they might go to Blade Runner. Um, all of these different ideas. And yes, we've got ideas like C-3PO um, and other sort of AIs that, yep, we can see they're doing good things. But quite often people will think about the bad things, thinking about 2001 and the evil supercomputer Hal, who I named my son after. Um, but what we tend to think of is if AI is going to do things, maybe it's, maybe it's not going to be all wonderful and all friendly. And so that seems to have pre-primed these, these sort of popular ideas of AI seem to have pre-primed us to be in a state of fear, in a state that is somewhat similar, somewhat analogous to the situations that Locke, Dicey, and Hayek found themselves in, where there was a, for them, a fundamental fear of something happening in society and that they wanted to come up with this sort of rule of law related idea in order to try and counter that. 
So the situation I think we find ourselves in is our society is fearful, perhaps justifiably, um, of some aspects of AI. And I think that has to feed into the ideas of whether we are willing to accept the idea of AI being in a position of power. And this is where it starts to overlap with the sort of rule of law ideas as to whether the AI in and of itself should wield power over us. Because if it does, that might not be seen as a good thing. And if it's not seen as a good thing, should we allow that to happen? Um, where are the controls on the AI? Um, we can kind of see and understand some of the controls that may operate on our government, but they're very different to what we might see operating on an artificial person or artificial persons that may be pulling some levers of power. So um, you've described as well in your recent article um, three sort of hypothetical situations where AI does exercise governmental power. Could you please talk us through those and the implications they might have? do whatever we want to do to exercise our democratic rights. Brilliant. But let's not do that anymore. Let's just do it on our phone. Every few years, do you vote for this party, this party, this party, this independent, wherever it might be? You make your decision secured by some sort of technology. Great. Basic application. We might not find that too scary. But if I jump up then to a, one of the most extreme potential hypotheticals, think about if we disposed with the legislature. So we basically get rid of Canberra completely. Um, we get rid of elected politicians or at least human elected politicians and we replace them with elected algorithms, still constituency based, but those algorithms who have predetermined ideas and ideals, um, so political ideals that they will conform to maybe a, using a very simple example, a left or a right or a center or whatever type position that they may hold. We would elect those algorithms. All these algorithms would get together. They would go to the virtual parliament and then they would make decisions. They would have uh, a discussion amongst themselves. They would figure out and vote on legislation and they would pass that legislation and pass a law as we would see it now with absolutely no human intervention whatsoever. That for most people would be considerably more terrifying. Um, the idea that the gloves are figuratively and literally off, um, that we let the algorithm do or algorithms do whatever they wanted. But arguably, they can make decisions faster, more efficiently, putting aside the issues of um, explainable AI, potentially in a more transparent way than our human elected representatives can do. And when I've thought about this a little bit more deeply and you consider the idea of the rule of law, the concept of the rule of law and the concept of democracy in the, the barest senses. And of course, we use those caveats I've just mentioned. What we can actually see is some of these really extreme applications actually make a lot more sense. Maybe if we can get rid of inherent bias that may be built into an algorithm, if we can know that it's not racist or sexist in its decision-making processes, and that we can actually see that decision-making process, maybe that is going to be a better way to make decisions than human decision-makers who are fundamentally flawed um, and potentially um, biased by a lot of other different things, maybe influenced by a lot of other different things that we will never see because we cannot see a human decision-making tree. Um, those sorts of ideas might be a really useful way to think about how technology might be used in a way that services democracy and services the rule of law. So I guess on top of the potential great service that AI can offer, do you think that the, the fears about AI, the fears about these worst case scenarios, do you think that these fears are bounded or rational? Um, I think the fears might be founded. Back to the, the one of the initial questions about thinking about whether we can and whether we should make a decision. Well, admitting being able to come up with general AI that would be the, the potential world ending threat that a lot of people see might be a very, very long way off. Um, I think the fears of 
algorithms making decisions that we don't intend them to make is a very rational fear. Um, we've already seen that because of our own human failings when it comes to creating algorithms, we can lead them off on a tangent we never wanted them to go and we can see algorithms that will ultimately teach themselves to become racist and sexist. Um, so in that sense, I think we're very well founded in our fears, whether we're thinking much further down the line and we're worried about accidentally creating a Skynet type machine, um, we might not be so well founded in that just yet, but I think it does sound a cautionary tale as to what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. Um, yeah. All right. So um, also you talk about AI as being a, a revolution or a time of fear. So we're, I guess we're living through several revolutions at the moment, including um, climate change, wealth inequality, and the pandemic. Do you see these other sources of fear as being things which will affect the rule of law in other ways? Absolutely. Um, so when we think about the way a, a society is pre-primed by fears, um, I think you're quite right in suggesting at the moment we are in a society that has many overlapping fears. Um, being in Victoria now, having recently come out of um, many lockdowns, have, having seen a number of protests um, in the streets about not just the lockdowns, but also the recently enacted um, pandemic bill that gives sweeping powers to the government and to the Premier. Um, that suggests, if nothing else, there are substantial fears that exist in society about the way that some powers are being used and being exercised. Now, we could have a different discussion around whether those fears are well-founded fears, whether they are real fears, but people do seem to be genuinely afraid of increased government oversight in any aspect of our lives. Um, I'm sure most people watching this probably have one of these little masks in their pocket. They have their app on their phone that they have to track their going in and going out of every building and showing their certificate and everything else. That's now a part of life. We have to now tell the government where we're going at almost every stage, um, if assuming we want a cup of coffee ever again in our lives. Only a couple of years ago, for most people that would be unthinkable. And I'm not talking about sort of um, classical liberal libertarian type people who are immediately skeptical of the government. Um, people who are just happily sitting somewhere in the center of the political spectrum who say, well, I'm actually just not that happy about doing that every time, but maybe they accept it. They might not like it. They certainly might not like the fact that now, and for the last couple of years, these huge, huge measures have been enacted to control everything that we can do. And people who maybe weren't living in a state of maybe fear or skepticism of governmental, the exercise of governmental power, maybe they're now. Um, especially because we seem to be, I won't say coming out of the pandemic, but obviously we're very highly vaccinated and all of these other things that are effectively defenses seem to be coming on board. Yet, maybe we're not even close to pre-pandemic freedom. Um, so I think there is a, a strong element of fear that we still see in society. And I think in the, the Venn diagram of fears, um, there are many, many different ones that are overlapping. So society here and many societies are certainly in the broader sense quite fearful and as i said that might be a well-founded um, idea of fear right. and um do you also see other technologies such as blockchain augmented reality or um, Neuralink applications as having a similar revolutionary effect and having this similar fear response um, so I think just the speed and pace at which many technological advances are moving and going in so many different ways, I think they could be rational reasons for an increased level of fear, but I, I get the sense that outside of the IT and the engineering space, um, or people who are very familiar with that area, 
there, there isn't as much general fear, maybe because we haven't seen, to my mind, you know, a, a popular story about some sort of technology taking over the world based on blockchain. Um, well, okay, maybe that will happen at some point. Um, but that lack of awareness seems to have not generated as much fear as the, the overall idea of artificial intelligence, which has, of course, been a buzzword for many, many years. And everybody has an idea about well, what is it? It is the thing that is going to kill us all. All right, thanks. And um, as the final question, um, do you see this increased level of fear and these fears which are popping up as being a positive, which improves our democracy? or as something which can sort of distort the debate? It's a great, great question. Um, I think it is a positive, but like most positives, unless you go to the extreme, um, I think we should have a healthy amount of fear of certain new applications of technology, of certain applications of government power, um, and certainly in the overlap between those two things. Um, if you think about the way the rule of law works in terms of different fears, yes, we might want to be helpfully skeptical of the government because that is what holds them to account. Um, if we are kind of fearful of the a massive amount of government overreach, then we might justifiably say, this particular government is trending too far in one direction. I'm not going to vote for them next time. And maybe that acts at keeping the the reins on just a little bit. If we are thinking in terms of technology, having a healthy amount of fear um, goes back to the question of, well, is this something that we should do? It just makes sure that we have, again, a, a small check to say, before we push this big red button, do we need to have a little bit more of a think about what it means. So I think having some sense of fear is a, is a good thing. So that's all the questions we had for you. Um, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything you wanted to add on the end of that? No, um, well, uh, yes. I can't say no and then not say anything. Uh, yes, so if anyone ever does want to have a conversation with me about this sort of stuff, if they're interested in some of the stuff I'm doing, um, by all means, they can get in contact with me through, um, through Monash. My work is up on Google Scholar. Um, the easiest way to find that is if you just Google my name, Paul Burgess and rule of law, I should be the, the first thing that comes up. I'm not an Australian Paul Volta. Um, I'm not a drummer. And I'm not the Paul Burgess from UCL, um, who is a cognitive neuroscientist, um, but I'm the one who does rule of law. So if ever you, um, anyone wants to reach out, they should feel free to do that or engage with me on Twitter. Um, but you take your life into your own hands if you do that.